hear me? All right, excellent. Well, it's, uh, it is really nice to be here today, and uh, thank you all for coming. I um, wanted to uh, introduce myself a little bit. Um, I was born and raised in the great city of Chicago, so I am back home now, and uh, it's nice to be back in Illinois. Um, grew up there, went to the University of Illinois Chicago, spent a year in college, and uh, did my MD and PhD there. And then uh, went to Duke University, where I did my general surgery training. Um, spent five years there, um, and then a year as faculty, at which point I got my MBA. And then after that, um, went to uh, the Texas Medical Center, where I spent two years doing vascular surgery training. So I've been in school for a really long time. Um, after that, I'm now back in Springfield, and it's really nice to be here. Um, so a few things. Um, I am a vascular surgeon, not a heart surgeon, um, and that means that I get to operate all over the body, and that is a lot of fun for me, because in the morning I'll operate in someone's neck and prevent stroke. Um, in the, later in the morning I might fix a dialysis axis in someone's arm, and then uh, in the afternoon I might do a leg bypass just like they do for the heart. So it's uh, very challenging, and it's a lot of fun. I love what I do. Um, so in vascular surgery, um, there's a lot of different things you can do. It's split up into both an arterial practice and a venous practice, and I do everything on this slide. Um, I fix aneurysms, I prevent stroke by fixing carotid arteries, um, peripheral artery disease, so if you can't walk very far, I can sometimes make that better for you. Um, dialysis access, I do minimally invasive surgery, and something called thoracic outlet syndrome, which I hope no one is uh, unfortunate enough to have in this room. For the vein practice, I do a variety of cosmetic cases, uh, something called sclerotherapy, which I'll talk to you about later today, uh, microflebectomy, vein ablations, I treat uh, clotted veins, and something called pelvic congestion syndrome too. And so I'll talk to you about uh, primarily venous disease today, but if you or you know someone who's got arterial problems, I'm happy to talk to you about that too. Um, I've uh, written a couple textbooks, four textbooks, on vascular surgery and vein surgery, so um, I've been doing this for a little while, and I, I love both the clinical aspect of it and the research aspect of it as well. So you're here to hit, learn a little bit more about veins and maybe get some of your questions answered too. So basically, I'll tell you a li little bit about the circulatory system, some of the causes of vein disease, what deep vein thrombosis is, uh, some of the more cosmetic aspects of vein care, which I might be able to help you with, and something called pelvic congestion syndrome too. And if there's time and interest at the end, you can play doctor as well. I've got a couple of cases that you can help me diagnose. and and a couple of patients you can help me take care of. So, circulatory system first. Um, these are arteries and these are veins. Um, put simply, arteries take blood from the heart and take it everywhere in the body. And if you've got a problem with the arteries, that's bad because tissues start to die. Um, and then the opposite side of this is the veins. And veins take blood from your toes and your fingers and everywhere else and bring it back to the heart. And if you've got a problem with your veins, that, that manifests in a variety of different ways. Um, tissues can sometimes die if you have a venous problem, um, but it tends to manifest with like leg swelling, cramping, and really more like congestion type sy uh, symptoms. And I'll go through that in a minute. Um, so there's a variety of causes for vein disease, and you can think of them as falling into two different categories. If you're on 55 and there's a bad accident, well, that's one form of vein disease. When you're on a superhighway and it goes down to one lane and you've got a huge traffic backup, that's what we call occlusion or stenosis. And basically what's happening is that this big pipeline has dropped down into one little pipeline that you've got to squeeze all the blood through and there's not a good way to make it happen. And so venous disease that leads to occlusion is something that we call venous thrombosis. And that's actually a pretty serious uh, issue. The other form of vein disease is called uh, venous reflux. Now, you can think of this as what happened with Hurricane Katrina um, when the levee started to overflow and water started dumping into uh, New Orleans. So uh, veins have valves inside of them, and these valves are supposed to help the blood get back up to your heart. When the valves fail, that leads to something called reflux. The levees overflow, and you've got way too much blood in your feet and your legs than you're supposed to. And that leads to congestion. That's a problem. So I am not going to go through this in any kind of detail, but basically um, we have a pretty good idea about some of the different causes of vein disease. We know how to improve some of them and prevent others. And if at the end of the day you still end up with like uh, um, pulmonary embolisms or clots or varicose veins or things like that, um, it's the 21st century. We've got a pretty good way of dealing with most of those problems. Um, 
So the first one I want to talk to you about is deep vein thrombosis. What is this? This is a clot in the deep veins that run in your legs. Um, it's actually a pretty serious problem. Um, this is a pretty good image that shows what I'm talking about. Um, blood is supposed to uh, basically go through your veins, and that's what this first part of the image uh, talks about. It's supposed to go through your veins without, uh, hang on, let's go back, without any major issues. The valves are supposed to keep the blood up, and you're not supposed to have any impediments. You're not supposed to have a traffic jam in your legs. What happens with deep vein thrombosis is that you get a big clot, that there's a, an accident on the highway, and blood has no way of getting back to your heart in a reliable manner. But that clot can cause a variety of problems. Um, first of all, and that's unfortunately all too common, if you're on an airplane ride for a long time, you've got some genetic predisposition, or you're just a little bit older, um, you can get a clot, and then your leg can look like, uh, like it's blown up like a big balloon. Um, both of those presentations are pretty common. Um, it tends to present with some pain, maybe some redness, a lot of swelling, and a lot of discomfort. Um, the issue with this is that it can lead to a variety of complications. If that is the only highway for, for blood to get back to your heart and it's completely blocked, imagine you've got this big pipe that's pushing all this blood into your legs with no way for that blood to get back up. So where does it go? It goes into the surrounding tissue, the skin, the muscle, and that leg starts to die. Um, and that's the condition called phlegmasia cerulea dolens, and that is a vascular surgery emergency. It's one of, uh, unfortunately, one of many reasons I'll wake up in the middle of the night to come into the hospital and, uh, and something that I need to take care of immediately. Because if I can't get that highway opened, that patient will lose their leg. Another big problem, you've probably heard about this, um, that clot in the leg can migrate and go to the lungs, and that's called a pulmonary embolism. Now, if that clot is big enough, that means that the veins in your, in your lung, which are supposed to help blood get through your circulation back to your heart and back to the rest of your body, if they're not working that well anymore, the heart starts beating harder and harder. Now, if you don't have a strong heart, it can only beat so, so hard before it gives up on you. So this can actually cause congestive heart failure, heart attacks, and sudden death. And if a clot's big enough, you won't survive that. So there's a variety of reasons why if you have a deep vein thrombosis, you wanna get prompt, immediate medical therapy. And so what do we do? Well, we have to get the diagnosis first. It's a non-invasive test. And basically what we look for is blood not flowing the veins the way it's supposed to. And if we have that diagnosis, we see the clot, um, and it's something that we can take care of medically, well, there's a variety of things we can do. I can admit you to the hospital, and I can put you on what's called um, IV medication. that's called heparin, and it makes your blood thinner, and it can actually help break down the clot a little bit. Another alternative is I can give you an injection. If it's not a big clot, you don't have major effects from it, I can give you an injection that you can actually do yourself. It's a little pinch in the belly button. You do it for a couple months, um, and hopefully this will get better. Now, in the worst cases, I, you sometimes have to go in and do an operation that takes takes the clot out of the veins and opens everything back up. But that's not very common, fortunately. Now, I think what you're most interested in is the varicose vein disease. And this is a very, very common problem. Um, keep in mind, that's like the levy that's overflowed. Um, and what you're basically looking at is that the normal valves in your veins, in your legs, um, they're supposed to keep the blood going back up towards your heart. I mean, we're standing all day long, and those valves, every time you bend your, your knee, that muscle pump activates, and it keeps pushing the blood back to your heart. Well, if you're standing all day, and those veins and those valves are not working the way they're supposed to, what ends up happening is that those veins, under all the increase in pressure, start to dilate. That dilation can lead to inflammation, it can lead to other problems around the vein, and if it gets dilated enough, it's actually possible for that vein to pierce out of your skin and actually start bleeding. And all it takes is just rubbing your leg against like a, um, some wooden structure or anything that cuts that vein, and you'll just bleed, 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 and just keep bleeding, because imagine what's happening. You've got all that pressure that's built up in that vein with no way to close it, and it just bleeds like you've cut an artery. So, it's actually pretty scary, and I've, I've taken care of a few patients that have uh, disease like that. The other part of the problem here is that with uh, veins that aren't working the way they're supposed to, the pressure builds up enough, and the veins are piercing the skin, the overlying skin can actually start to erode and die, and that leads to these horrible ulcers that can take months to cure. And my nurse Kelly is here today, too, and she'll tell you all about uh, how bad some of those problems can be. Um, so this is on the milder end. Um, some of this can be purely cosmetic, and some of it can actually be clinically symptomatic. Um, 
so the, the leg over here on the left, th those are varicose veins. Um, those are the veins that are popping through the skin. And they can be painful, they can be irritating, they can cause cramping at night, um, and all sorts of other issues. And that's something which is relatively easy to take care of. I can, uh, sometimes I can actually inject a little foam solution into them and get rid of them from, uh, from the inside. Sometimes I make a very tiny little cut and just hook them out like you're you know, uh, getting, uh, catching some bait for fishing or something. Um, and uh, it's relatively painless. It's an outpatient procedure. It takes about 10, 20 minutes to do. Very straightforward. Um, the legs on the right um, are uh, showing spider veins. And these are, it really looks like a spider's web. Um, they can also range from being purely cosmetic, you don't like the way it looks, to actually being symptomatic. It can be painful, itching, burning, and all sorts of other things. And so um, that's also easy to take care of. Um, I, I quite literally inject a soapy, foamy solution into those veins, and I do this in the clinic, and they disappear in front of you. And so I, every time I do this with patients, I'm ooing and aahing the whole time because I, I, you know, these veins are disappearing in front of us. So, it, as you can tell, I love what I do, and it's, I'm a little crazy for it, but it, it's fun. Um, it really does. <laughs> it really does get me excited. So I've got my nurses going in the back, and they're going, we're all ooing and aahing, and the patient's all getting excited, and you, you have to be there. Um, or maybe you don't want to be there. But. So it, this kind of uh, venous disease is really on a continuum. You know, I gave you two simple examples, varicose veins and spider veins. But if your venous reflux is bad enough, that venous disease can get significantly more worrisome and troublesome. This is called uh, lipodermatosclerosis. It's a fancy word that means reddening and thickening of the skin. And this happens after years of vein problems. And this is something which I can't fix. Once you start getting problems like this in the skin, that's permanent. But what I can do is take away the underlying vein problems that are causing this and prevent, and prevent it from getting worse. Now, if you've gone through all of this, you still haven't seen a doctor, um, and you're getting this lipodermatosclerosis, thickening and reddening the skin, even some inflammation and maybe even an infection, in some people what can eventually happen is that. Um, and believe it or not, that's a mild case. That's the leg that's developing a lot of pus. The skin's breaking down. It's going to the soft tissue. That is an infection of the leg. And that's, a, that's actually a big deal, because if that infection gets significantly worse, um, I've actually had to do an amputation on someone that had such horrible ulcers, there was no hope. There was no way to make it better. And we're taking care of a few people right now that have gotten these ulcers from years of vein disease that hasn't been properly treated or diagnosed. Um, this is a place you do not want to be. So, you know, every, everything we do as, as surgeons and doctors usually has some rhyme and reason to it. Um, and so there's, there's a scale that we use to quantify vein disease. Um, if you're lucky and don't really have any major vein disease, you're C0 on the scale. And then those ulcers I was showing you in the last slide, that's all the way on the far end of the spectrum, and that's C6, the most severe kind of vein disease you can have. And most people tend to be somewhere in between. Um, if you have a lot of ankle swelling, if you have a lot of... Uh, uh, cramping or even burning in your legs, that might be vein disease. That's, that tends to be on the milder end of the spectrum, but it's still something that can lead to significant problems down the road. And there's a variety of things I can do to make that better if that really bothers you. Um, and then, we're, then you get into like the varicose veins, the reticular and spider veins, and then that reddening of the skin I was telling you about that's called lipodermatosclerosis. Now you're getting into much more severe venous disease. Um, it's easy to diagnose. We have an ultrasound in the lab that we, uh, in, the same, in the same clinic that we do all these procedures in. And basically, you come in in the morning. You can see, uh, see me in the morning. We can get this ultrasound done in the same afternoon if they're available um, or at your convenience. And what they're looking for is a broken levy. They're looking for the blood coming back down the leg instead of it staying back up where it's supposed to. So if the, if the valves aren't working, the blood just goes back and forth, up and down. And if it starts flowing in the wrong direction and it flows for more than half a second or a second, depending on the vein you're looking at, you probably have a problem with venous reflux. Um, that's something I can fix. And that's done using a very straightforward procedure. So uh, 15 years ago, when I, um, when I was still in Chicago, uh, my mom had varicose vein disease and venous reflux disease, and they didn't have this kind of technology back then. Um, I still remember her going through this. She had horrible leg swelling. She works as a cashier at Marshall's, and, uh, and she stands all day long. And so she used to come home with these horribly swollen, painful legs, and it would take her all night to get those legs back down to a normal size. And she'd have to go back to work again the next day, just very, very painful. 
She finally got referred to a vein surgeon, and they didn't have this fancy technology that we have now, and so she actually had to have her leg cut open and get those veins removed, and that's called vein stripping, and you've probably heard about that. It's painful, and today it's generally unnecessary. I don't do it. Um, instead, um, we, we have something called um, radiofrequency ablation, or endovenous ablation, and how this works is that you make nothing more than a tiny little puncture on the inside of your leg, and you put a catheter all the way up to your groin. You find, out, you find the vein that's not working by ultrasound, so it's all non-invasive except for this little puncture in the, in the leg. Put the catheter all the way up, and you quite literally hit just one button on this machine, and it burns the vein out from the inside. It's an outpatient procedure, it's relatively painless, and you go home the same day, and you're back at work the next day if you want to. So completely different than what we used to do 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, uh, if my mom hadn't been treated back then, believe me, she'd be my first patient in my clinic today. Um, so, and, and this works incredibly well. Um, now, there's other ways I can do this. Um, if you've got those painful varicose veins like, that I was telling you about before, I said something about microphlebectomy. What that is, is that if you've got veins that aren't amenable to this catheter-based treatment and your legs look something like this, um, I can quite literally make a very little cut just over those veins, put a hook in there, get rid of the vein from the inside, and close it back up. It's not as painful as you think. It takes, like I said, 10, 20 minutes in the clinic, maybe a little bit more depending on how many we have to do. And again, it's outpatient. You go home the same day, back at work the next day. Very straightforward. Um, I also do something called sclerotherapy. Now, this is, I, I do this for both cosmetic reasons and if they're painful. Um, typically how it works is that if it's purely cosmetic and it's not bothering you at all, you just want to get into shorts or, or a skirt or something for the summer, insurance probably won't cover something like that, and that's out of pocket. But if it bothers you, if it itches, if it burns, if it's painful, um, if it's clinically significant, insurance might cover something like that. And so the, these are results which are actually pretty typical. Um, you're, if you've got these spider veins in your thigh or your leg or your feet, um, I can inject that foamy soap solution I was telling you about, and your legs can go back to normal in many cases. Now, I can't promise a cure for everyone, um, but I can, uh, the results I've had so far have been very good. Um, and people, I, I really do think that a lot of my patients are going to get back into shorts and skirts when uh, spring and summer roll around. So it's a good season to do it because we're all wearing pants right now. At least I hope we are. Um, and the last thing I want to talk to you about is something called pelvic congestion syndrome. And uh, I've seen a number of patients in my clinic about this, and uh, I added this on late last night because it, it's something that's actually really important to me. Um, where this is a, a disease that's actually very common in women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and even 50s. Um, and how this presents is uh, abdominal or, or like belly fullness, pelvic fullness. Um, you can get vaginal bleeding. Uh, it leads to a lot of pain and discomfort over months of time. And sometimes your doctor might start you on birth control to try to make this better, um, but that often fails in most patients. And basically what's happening is that the same process that affects the legs and the, that, that affects the veins in the legs, the varicose veins, it's the same thing going on in the pelvis. And so the veins that go to the ovaries, the veins that go to the uterus, et cetera, those can swell just like this. And every time you stand up, you might have some fullness or, or stabbing pain even. Um, and, and, the, and the symptoms vary by patient. And, uh, and the cure for this used to be that you had to get your entire uterus and both ovaries taken out. And that's a surgical procedure. And that's unnecessary for most people today. Because, um, and this is some research that we're doing right now, and, and we've had some uh, very nice success with this so far. Um, we're able to uh, make a little puncture in the groin, just like we do with this catheter for the legs. I can make a little puncture in the groin, weave a little wire in a catheter into the veins that are defective, do a little test from the inside to figure out whether that vein's working or not, and get rid of it completely from the inside. I did this last week. It's an outpatient procedure. That patient went home the same day. I saw her in clinic last Friday, completely cured. So again, I, I can't promise that for everyone, but I am so happy she was able to do this. She's a young lady, and she wasn't even able to have um, relations with her husband. She wanted to get pregnant, wasn't able to do any of that. And when I saw her in clinic, she got up, gave me a big smile, gave me a big hug, and it's nice to be able to make a difference for people um, for a problem that we actually know very little about today. So I'm hoping that the research we're doing will make an impact.
and make a difference. And we're actually starting a, a study right now with uh, the vein centers at Johns Hopkins and the vein centers at Mayo Clinic. And so this is something that you may be seeing down in the pipeline in the next uh, year or two. Um, like I was saying, pelvic congestion syndrome presents with a variety of issues. Um, it's abdominal and pelvic pain, discomfort, usually it's over six months. The pressure and fullness I was telling you about, frequent urination is very common. Pain during intercourse is uh, also unfortunately very common. Um, and then the vaginal bleeding I mentioned as well. Simple ultrasound diagnosis this, and uh, it's a, a minimally invasive procedure to fix it. So the results can be very good. So. Uh, any interest in playing doctor? I've got a couple of cases if you're interested in. Is it? Yeah? All right, here we go. Okay, number one. Um, you've got a 54-year-old man who has left calf swelling after flying from New York to Los Angeles. He was on a long plane. He flies United like, like you all do, right? Everyone flies United here? Okay, good. Um, so what do you think? I hear a vote for a clot. Does anyone think anything different? DVT, yeah, this is a deep vein thrombosis, most likely. Um, if, uh, if he's an older gentleman, if he's got risk factors for this, if he's had it before, um, and he was lying still on a cross-country uh, flight, um, you've got to be worried about a clot. So, doctor, um, what do you want to do? You've got the diagnosis, what's the treatment? Heparin, yes. Heparin, Lovenox, those are all different medications you can give. The idea is to anticoagulate him, right? Make the blood thinner. You make the blood thin enough, hopefully this clot won't propagate into something more serious like an embolism. Um, and of course, if his leg starts swelling up, turns purple and blue, and he can't feel anything in his toes anymore, uh, he's going to call 911 and come see me. Um, okay, very good. Number two. Yeah. How could he have avoided a clot? Um, that's a great question. Um, so if you're flying around the country or you're going for a long drive um, or you know you've got a predisposition to this, you want to take regular breaks, get up, walk around, and exercise those pumps in your calf. And the more you do that, the less likely you're going to have problems in the future. Um, because believe me, you do not want to come see me. Um, I, that's probably bad for business, I shouldn't say that, but, <laughs> but it's true. I, I take care of the sickest people in the world sometimes, and I, I am the last person you want to see sometimes. Um, all right, case number two. We've got a 34-year-old woman who has leg cramping and ankle swelling by the end of the day, and that's really what her feet and ankles look like. Um, what do you think is the diagnosis? Someone said occlusion, someone said reflux. I need a tie-breaking vote here. Who thinks, who thinks reflex? Raise your hand. Three votes for reflex. How many people? So everyone else thinks that this is a clot. Who doesn't want to participate? <laughs> <laughs> reflex. Um, this is most likely reflex. It could be clot. You're not wrong to say that. Um, because uh, really, I don't know until I do a test. I've got to do an ultrasound to know for sure. So if I do the ultrasound and I see the blood pouring right back into the leg, it's probably reflux. If I don't see blood making it back to the heart, that might be a clot. This particular patient had reflux. So the treatment for that, it varies. We can do compression stockings. In fact, insurance re uh, requires that I do that for six weeks to three months. Uh, and in truth, you know, some people actually do get better with those compression stockings, and, th and that may be all you need. Most people don't. Um, and then they come to me, and, and they've got this horrible leg swelling and pain and cramping and night cramps and everything else. And uh, we do the compression hose, and they say, you know, it still doesn't work. What can you do? And at that point, we start looking at those vein ablations and other minimally invasive approaches to make them feel better. So. Anyway, I, um, I'm very fortunate to have uh, uh, three awesome partners. Um, I work at SIU, obviously, and I work at both hospitals, and uh, doctors Pan, Hodgson, and Hood are, are great people to work with. Um, I, I do most of the vein stuff, um, along with the uh, thoracic outlet stuff and, and a lot of the pelvic congestion stuff. Um, but if you're interested in seeing us, that's actually not a picture of it. We've got to get a picture of our new clinic building, but we have a brand new building uh, with ultrasound built into it and everything. So and I can do these procedures right there in, in a very nice procedure room that we've just built dedicated to this purpose. But uh, come see us if you have uh, any issues. The question was, um, after I inject the soapy foam solution, how do you know it's not going to go to the brain or the heart or cause other major problems? And that's actually a known complication of that procedure. If you are doing it wrong or you're unlucky and you use too much pressure or you inject the wrong vein or you're not doing it properly, 
The veins are all connected together. They're all connected to the heart, and they all eventually connect to arteries. And you don't want that foamy solution getting into the arteries that go to the heart or the brain or anything like that. Um, there is maybe a one in a thousand chance or less of that actually happening. Um, it may be more likely that the ceiling caves in on us. But um, it, it's a risk, and if you're injecting big caliber veins or using way too much pressure to do this, that's when the risk is highest. The little spider veins I was talking about that I'm injecting this stuff into, it's by the time you get to that kind of pressure, those veins are going to rupture. So that foamy solution is not getting back to your heart or your brain. Um, and uh, I've never had that complication before, but uh, I'm also very careful about the patients I'm doing this in. I'm picking the narrowest caliber veins, the ones that are most superficial, and staying away from anything that might be connected to a deep vein that eventually gets connected back to the heart. So every time I've done this, that solution spreads along the surface and stays there. So we, we take every precaution we can. The question was, uh, if I'm doing some of these procedures on the varicose veins or, or like the great saphenous vein, the reflux procedures, et cetera, what kind of anesthetic am I using? Is it general anesthesia? Is it in the operating room and whatnot? Um, the, the way I do this, it's, I, it's called an outpatient procedure. I do this in the clinic, um, and we've got a procedure room where we do this in. There is no general anesthesia, there is no breathing tube, um, and all those chemicals that give you to put you to sleep and all of that, there's no need for any of that. The most you get is a little Valium the morning of, and Kelly will call that in for you, um, and so you're nice and calm by the time you see me. Um, <laughs> and the only screaming going on in the room is, is Kelly, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, um, and uh, so you get a Valium, you're nice and calm, and uh, it's, uh, I, I numb up the entire area with local anesthetics. It's called lidocaine. Um, and uh, I numb everything up and get the catheter inside and do the procedure. Or if you're going to need the varicose vein procedure, um, that incision is so small that I use just a very tiny amount of lidocaine. And in most cases, I don't even need very much at all. And so people barely feel anything. It's completely numb. Um, and the veins come right out. The only thing you've got to worry about is putting uh, a Band-Aid on and keeping some pressure on that. That's it. Very straightforward. And, and it's, it's really amazing. I mean, to me, it's almost magical because, you know, I've been in healthcare long enough that I've seen all these things evolve over time, and it's nice to see things going in this direction. It can be pretty traumatic for people to have a, a giant knife. <laughs> so I, uh, the question was, um, sclerotherapy is good for the legs, but they recommend laser for the face. Um, I... I've seen both done on the face and other parts of the body, and I've seen laser done on the legs as well. Um, the reason I prefer sclerotherapy over laser is that I, I think it works better. I think the cosmetic results are superior. Um, sclerotherapy I can use in two different ways. I can use the soap solution straight, purified, without any, any of the foam, and that works really well for some of the spider veins. Or I can use it as the foam, and that works a lot better for some of the slightly larger veins, like reticular veins. Laser. Um, I, when I've seen laser done in the past, I've seen brown spots left behind, I've seen clots in the veins, and I personally think laser is a heck of a lot more painful than sclerotherapy is. Most people don't even feel the needle prick when I do the sclerotherapy. Yeah, she was saying that laser can cause scarring, the brown spots, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I personally would not use and do not use laser anywhere in the body and would not use it on the face either. Um, I've had good results with sclerotherapy almost anywhere in the body. Sure. Question was, when should you come see me if you've got venous disease? Um, let me tell you a story about one of the first patients I saw here in Springfield. Um, Middle-aged woman, very nice lady, uh, came from far southern Illinois, somewhere around Carbondale. And she had had venous disease for about 15 years. And, and she had leg swelling, some cramping, night cramps, some pain, and a lot of discomfort. Well, she had seen her regular doctor who did not know what this was. Um, and gave her narcotics, Tylenol, Motrin, all sorts of other therapies, and just let it go, let it go, and let it go. Well, the years passed by, the vein disease got worse. It started off as those little tiny spider veins, and then developed into reticular veins, the varicose veins popping out of the skin. Sometimes they bled, and her doctor said, just put a dressing on it. Um, she did that, she went back to him religiously, and he, he was supposed to be taking care of her leg veins. Um, well, eventually, enough veins popped out of the surface that the skin around it started to die, and she started developing these horrible ulcers. Well, uh, her doctor hadn't seen this before, um, because vein disease in the United States rarely gets this bad. Um, and so he recommended dressings. Well, he finally couldn't take care of her anymore because she got so sick from these ulcers, she had to go to the hospital. Thankfully, she came to see us in Springfield. 
Um, and so she went to the ICU because she was so sick from these ulcers, it was actually dropping her blood pressure and compromising her heart. To save her life from, these, from this vein disease, I had to do an amputation of both legs below the knees. You do not want to get to that point. Now, it's uncommon. That, that does not happen very often with vein disease, but it obviously does happen. Now, you don't want to get to that point. Um, if you, the, way I, the way I think about this is that if you have vein disease that bothers you, if you have leg swelling that bothers you, and even if it's just cosmetic and it bothers you, you just want to wear shorts in the summer, I'm happy to take care of you. Um, there's, um, it, that hasn't always been the case in Springfield. Um, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking care of the whole person. If it's just cosmetic, I don't have a problem with that. And if it bothers you, I think that's something that should be fixed. Um, if you've got more severe vein disease or you've been bouncing around be between different doctors and you're not quite sure what's going on, I'm happy to take a look. So I would say the earlier the better, to answer your question. Question was, uh, how, if, if your mom had varicose veins, what's the likelihood of you having bad varicose veins too, basically, versus a healthy lifestyle and preventing some of this? Um, I, uh, I wear compression stockings because my mom had varicose veins. So hereditary and genetic factors certainly play a big role in this. Um, but at the same time, I, I think if you watch your weight and you exercise and you make an effort to get off your feet and, and exercise that pump, you eat healthy in general, I think that's the best anyone can do. That's a great question. Um, so the question was, if I'm taking all these veins out on the surface of the skin, where the heck is the blood going to go? Um, and, uh, and so you have to make sure that the big highways in the legs, the deep veins, are working and present. And that's why we always get an ultrasound first. I'm not going to operate on you, do any procedure on you, until I know exactly what's going on, and I've got a plan A, B, C, and D. Um, so once all that's said, and I'm sure that the super highways are there, all I'm doing is getting rid of the bad veins, that traffic should not be going down. And once I get rid of that, all the traffic will naturally go to the superhighways. Thank you. The question was, if I'm uh, taking this long vein out of the leg, um, is that going to cause a lot of pain because it's attached to capillaries, et cetera? And the, the answer to the question is, it, it, in most cases, no. And the reason is, is because it, we have pain because we have nerves. Well, there aren't very many nerves at all attached to veins. In fact, there are none. Um, and so if I'm stripping only the vein out and not taking anything else with, with it, which is exactly what I'm doing, the only pain you're going to have is really a little bit of discomfort from the incision itself. And that's maybe a quarter of an inch long. It's tiny. Sure. question was about the recovery time after getting some of these procedures done. So um, I'm, uh, I make my patients walk back to their car after this procedure is done. And it's because they can. Uh, it's, it's, it's relatively pain-free. Um, and, and it doesn't affect their ability to walk or anything. Um, I, I prefer that they don't drive home because they usually have a Valium on board. Um, you don't want to get pulled over and get a drug test, and uh, I don't want to get a phone call from your, yeah, exactly, from the judge or whatever. Um, but, uh, so if you've got someone who can drive you home, that's perfect. Um, most people rest the rest of the day, but you don't have to. Um, You've got a compression stocking on that's usually that we wrap on after we get most of these procedures done. Um, that comes off in one or two days. You can go back to work the next day if you really want to. I have no objection to that. Um, and the only other thing you've got to do if I do the vein ablation procedure, I want to see you back in my clinic within two or three days to do a confirmatory ultrasound to make sure that we actually fix the problem. That's it. I work, uh, the question was, uh, is there a good time of the year to get this done? I work eight days a week, so um, we're, uh, <laughs> any time is what I would say. Um, basically, I, I know that if you've got the cosmetic stuff going on, um, winter is a great time. Fall and winter are great times to get that done because you can hide what's going on under your pant legs. And then by the time spring rolls around, you've got these sexy legs again. So, you know, I, that's a good time to get it done. But if you've got uh, pain or discomfort or something that's a little bit more than cosmetic, don't wait. I, I wouldn't. I would just, I, the process can take up to three months uh, to go through approval through insurance. So the sooner you come and get the ball rolling, the better it is for you. Yeah. One of the, re the question was, uh, is there a risk of blood clots after this procedure is done? And that's one of the reasons we actually get that ultrasound done. Um, it's never happened to me, but I've seen it happen to one of my partners once. And the treatment's straightforward. It's a tiny little clot in most cases, and you, you, you may require um, the blood thinners for about three months or less. Um, that particular patient had blood thinners for about a month after that, 
um, and had no problems after that. So the, the question was, if you've had previous therapy for your spider veins, is there a chance for them to come back? And the answer is unfortunately yes. Um, because if you, if you are just treating what you see in front of you and not doing a more comprehensive exam to find out what the cause of those spider veins is, you haven't really fixed the problem. Now, you can't always fix the problem. Sometimes our best tests don't identify the root cause of those spider veins. In that case, you can inject all of them, make them go away, and in most cases, in my hands, that's been permanent. But I have seen a few patients where those spider veins have come back in other areas. I just treat them again and, uh, and take care of them that way. Oh, okay, so the question was, uh, or the comment was, um, if you've had sclerotherapy done before and the veins turn brown or black, you would expect that to go away. I'm sorry that didn't go away. Um, because in most cases, that's a little bit of a blood clot that's left behind from the sclerotherapy. Um, and that goes away for most patients within a couple weeks. Now, if it really hasn't, there's all sorts of bleaching creams and other things I can do to make that better. If you've had laser and you've got the brown spots from the laser, the only thing I can do to make that better is the bleaching creams. And that's not very successful for those particular spots. Yeah. Yes, it's a great question. Um, so out of the vein clinics I've had so far this year, I've actually had a resident attend the vein clinic once and observe a procedure once. Um, if, uh, I, I train the future generation of doctors too, right? Um, and so if, if it's a resident who I've had good experience with and they've seen me do this a number of times and the patient is comfortable with it, I will let them participate in the procedure under my direct supervision. I'm never out of the room and they never do it alone. Question was, if you have an AVM or PVD disease, does that, is that related to varicose veins? AVMs are arteriovenous malformations, and this is an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein. And PVD or PAD, um, that's peripheral artery disease, and that's more arterial in nature. Um, are these related to varicose veins? Not really. Um, those are separate systems, and the, and the pathology and physiology is usually completely different. Now, with that said, um, I can actually do sclerotherapy to treat AVMs. Um, at Duke, uh, when I was going through my general surgery training, it's actually a center for treating AVMs. And I once took care of a little boy who had this horrible red splotch in his face, and uh, we did sclerotherapy. And within maybe three months of treatment, that splotch had gone down to maybe a nickel-sized spot. So we've had some good success with that. Sure. If, uh, if it's not something that you're necessarily interested in getting removed, if it's a spider vein or a reticular vein or something, and, and you're quite okay with it, it doesn't bother you and you don't want something done for cosmetic reasons, um, what I would recommend is compression stockings. And it's, it's prescription grade support hose. Um, it can go as high as your knee or your thigh or even up your waist, depending on how much of your leg is affected. Um, and, uh, and basically that will help prevent that uh, vein disease from getting worse and prevent new uh, defective veins from cropping up. It's not 100% successful, but if you've got a good doctor who's taking care of you and watching you and you keep an eye on it, it's the best anyone can do. The bigger, I guess the bigger question you're asking is when should you worry about these varicose veins? Um, if you have a varicose vein and it bothers you, you should be worried about it, is what I would say. If, uh, and bother means itching, burning, pain, or even just the cosmetic appearance of it. it everyone's different. Um, there is no marker for when you need an intervention. If it's above the knee, at the hip, up by your buttocks, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I, would, I wouldn't wait for something like that because if the veins have gotten to the point where they're affecting your entire leg, basically what's happening is that the veins are responding to um, high blood pressure within the entire venous system. And the longer you wait, the more damage is occurring. So you don't want to wait till this is all the way up your, uh, up your leg. Um, I, I would say the sooner the better, and because there may be something deeper underlying all of this. So you want, to, you want a good diagnosis. All right? Okay. All right. Well, it was very nice being here today, and thank you very much. Thank you.